Good morning. And welcome to worship at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church this morning. We are heading into our last little bit of readings from Acts. The Acts of the Apostles have been, we've been following throughout this Easter season that wraps up in Pentecost. And once Pentecost hits, we have our usual three readings, Old Testament epistle and gospel. And in this week's reading from Acts, this is the disciples living in a post-ascension, post-Judas world, where they're going to have to decide now who is going to take up the mantle of Judas to continue to be the apostle. And what's interesting is not necessarily that that decision was made, but how it was made. I invite you to rise as our service begins with our opening song, Amazing Grace. Great. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. O God, save me by your name, and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. 
Let us humble ourselves before God and confess our sins to him, praying for his gracious forgiveness. O Lord God Almighty, we confess that we are sinful human beings by nature and by deed. We have not always put you first. We have used your holy name in ways that do not honor you and have not been constant in prayer and devotion. We have not always been thoughtful caretakers of your creation and have not shared its bounty with others at all times. We have not kept our thoughts, words, and deeds fully pure and honorable. We have sinned in ways we know and in ways we do not even recognize. We have coveted that which is not rightfully ours and have not put the best construction on all things and on all people. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Forgive us our sins. And finally, by your grace, bring us to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high on a rock. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
I invite you to rise for prayer. Our Lord be with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the spirit of truth whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our first two readings. And the first reading we have for today is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James, all of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up and among the brothers, the company of persons was about 120 in all, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now, this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed is the man who not walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the way knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading for today is from 1 John, the fifth chapter. If we receive the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God 
that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. I invite you to rise. Alleluia. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, that not one of them has been lost except the son of, dest of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated at this time. All right, good morning, friends. So who here has ever owned a dog? Few people, who here has ever seen a dog? Oh good, few more people, I'm glad. Now, one thing you may have noticed about a dog, especially if they are outdoors with their owner, is that generally their owner will keep them on a leash, right? If they're going for a walk or something, their owner will have a leash so that the dog doesn't get too far away. And if we're being honest, a lot of times that's for the dog's safety, right? It's so that the dog doesn't run off into traffic, get harmed by a car, doesn't go and sniff another dog that doesn't particularly want to be sniffed, you know. And so this leash is used to keep the dog safe, to keep the dog where you can see them, to have some control, and to kind of know what this dog is up to. Now, why am I bringing up a dog and a leash? Because that's not anywhere in the readings, I will tell you. The way that we as dog owners keep our dogs safe by keeping them on a leash can be applied to us too. When we see Jesus talking in the gospel reading, he is talking about how he keeps his disciples safe. He keeps them close by so that they're not wandering away, they're not being curious about things that they ought not be curious about, they are not wandering away from Jesus' teachings, He's keeping them close. He's keeping them safe. Now, I'm going to go back to dogs, though. Because one thing about dogs is that they have certain things that they do very well. If you have a shepherd, 
like a German shepherd or I have Australian shepherds, they like to herd, right? Which is great if you have a bunch of sheep or small children, that this dog would herd them, would keep them safe, right? When you have them on a leash, they can't do the thing that they are meant to do. So eventually, it doesn't make sense to have a dog on the leash. If you have your dog in your backyard, you're probably not gonna have them on a leash. If you have your dog in your house, you're not gonna have them on a leash. Because although you wanna keep them safe, you know you can't keep them safe all the time. You can't keep them from doing what they're meant to do. And Jesus says the same about his disciples. He's keeping them safe while he can, but he knows that they have a purpose. He knows they have something that they need to do. And so at the time, he leaves them. He removes that safety net from them so that they can go and do what they are meant to do. And for us too, Jesus has given us what we need in order to be able to do his will. He has given us the tools and the ability to go out to share his word, to share the good news. We don't necessarily have that safety net, that leash that maybe we want, but we know that God has given us what we need. He has sent his son to prepare the way, and we know that what God has planned for us is good. And although we don't have the safety here, we know we have the safety of his place that he has prepared for us in heaven, and we give thanks for that today. So let's join together and we will say a word of prayer, giving thanks to God for what he has given to us. Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that you have given us the opportunity to do good works here on earth, that you have given us the tool of your Holy Spirit that we can go forth, we can share your word with all those who would be able to hear it. We pray that you would keep us mindful of you and that you would Remind us of the great place of great safety that you have for us prepared in heaven. We pray this in your name. Amen. And I would invite you to join in singing our next song.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, this economy that we're in has been a real roller coaster ride for a bunch of different industries, has it not? Because right now, there's a few industries that are hurting quite a bit more than they are used to. Uh, so, things like uh, the airlines are hurting, uh, cruise ships are in real trouble. Boy, are they. Uh, you've got things like the hospitality industry is in bad shape, attendance is down for all these sorts of things, charities are hurting. But on the flip side, a lot of industries are doing very well. For example, your hardware stores are doing just fine. The uh, price of lumber is out of control right now. I don't know if you noticed that, but wow, that went up. Uh, and you know, your big box retailers, your Walmarts, having a great year. And e-commerce is doing extremely well. While we were all sitting at home and not doing too much else, we all had time and space to order things through the internet. And a few sassy up-and-coming e-commerce sites took off. One that took off, a little one you've probably never heard of, it's called Amazon. Yeah, right. Uh, go ahead and look at their logo. It's very cutely designed because they have like the Amazon all spelled out and they have that little smile underneath. And the smile goes from the A to the Z with the little arrow there telling you that they have everything that you need from A to Z. Back when I was your age, Jacob, they just sold books. Imagine that, now they have everything. Now, if you've ever ordered anything on Amazon, and statistically you have, you will know that after you order something, be it a, a cookbook or a set of headphones or a, a case of sardines, yes, you can get those from Amazon, anything that you order through Amazon, very shortly after that, you will get an email from the company that sells it. And the company that sells it will say something along the lines of, hello, valued customer. We here at Bob's Headphones want to make sure that your experience has been a good one. So can you please go on and leave a review on the website, on Amazon, to let everybody know what a good set of headphones that you bought. Why do they do that? Because they all do. Well, you should know by now that your brain that you have is like my brain, which is not an ever-expanding space that you can fit more and more and more information in. What do you know about headphones or cookbooks or anything like that? The same thing I do, which is not much. So what you do and I do and everybody does, which is you go onto Amazon and you look for the highest rated set of headphones and just buy those. Because believe it or not, you don't have the time and the effort and the wherewithal to do all the research for every single decision that you would like to do. So you are counting on a vast supply of other people to in fact help you make that decision. This is like phoning a friend or talking to your mother or whatever, but on a much wider scale where you are looking at the absolute highest rated thing that you can find, if it has like 10,000 five-star reviews, you're gonna say, well, that's probably good. I might wanna go with that one. Now, when you're looking at how the disciples chose the replacement for Judas, they are aware that this is a big decision. And the bigger the decision, the more you are going to want to have some help in making it. If a decision is like really, really big and really, really important, you are going to want a lot of help in making it. You're not gonna to wanna to feel comfortable making that one all on your own. Buying a pair of pants is one thing. Deciding to like move to a different house is quite another. You're gonna want some input on that one. So when they draw lots, as it says in our reading from Acts, when they draw lots, what that is, is that is the disciples effectively taking themselves out of the decision-making process. They are saying this decision is too big for us to make. We don't know enough, 
We are not wise enough or smart enough. We cannot possibly determine who would be the better replacement for Judas. So we are going to take ourselves out of this equation altogether, and we are going to let God decide. And they draw lots, and the lot falls on Matthias. There are a few times in the Bible where people draw lots for things. Uh, One of them is more like gambling, which is what they do to divide the clothing of Christ. When he is crucified and they draw lots to see who gets to keep his tunic because that is one big long woven piece and they can't take it apart without totally ruining it. The other time is when Jonah is on board the boat sailing directly away from Nineveh and they are in the middle of a storm And that's when they draw lots to see which of them has so angered God as to make this storm threaten to swamp the boat and sink it. So they drew lots, and the lot pointed out that maybe Jonah was the problem, and then he, of course, copped to it right away and said, yep, that's me, I'm running away from God. They threw him overboard, got swallowed by the fish, you know the story. So the bigger the decision, the more people wanted to involve God in it. And this wasn't just Christians, by the way. There's a big, long history of people consulting things to try and get what God would have in mind for them to do. Uh, Things like astrology or divination or, or, or cutting open animals to read their entrails. Anything like that. A wide variety of things that were practiced and done to try and work out what God would have you do, what the will of God was. Now, I'm gonna say that I think that we as Christians should involve God in the decision-making process more than we do. Now, does that mean that I think that you or I or anybody else should be walking around two-faced style, flipping a coin to see which way God would have us go every day? No, and you don't need to. Remember how I said that the more important a decision is, the more you're going to want God to be involved with it? like the bigger, more impactful decisions, you can figure out where to go and buy spaghetti by yourself. That's not like a moral or ethical decision necessarily. But there's a good chance that the more important a decision is, the more you're going to want to involve God. And what are the biggest, most important decisions that we make on a day-to-day basis? In reality, if we approach this as Christians, what you have to understand is that the dryer that you buy, you're going to have for 10 years. You know, uh, the, the, the TV you buy, you're going to have for eight years. The car you buy, you're going to have for 12 years. Whatever it is, these things are not of eternal consequence. But the way in which you treat your fellow human beings actually is of eternal consequence. Because unlike your car, unlike your TV, unlike your dryer, unlike your house, unlike all these things where moth destroys and rust breaks down, the people that you deal with are forever. They never go away. They are eternal people. So the decisions on how to interact with each other are actually of eternal consequence. Like they really do matter. And for these things, we can involve God directly. We can ask him what exactly we should do. And it's not by drawing lots, it's not by divination, it's not by flipping coins. You don't need to do that because the will of God is not exactly obscure. It's not something that's hard to find out. The only reason we don't involve him more in our decision-making process is because we don't really like the answer that he's going to come up with. So what is the answer that he's going to come up with? I mean, in all honesty, it's broad enough to encompass all of human experience. If you have your bulletins on you, go ahead and turn to page 18. And if you don't, I'll read it out for you. It's not a big deal. Page 18 is our benediction. And in our benediction, it tells you, Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold to what is good, return no man evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
that right there will encompass most of your interactions with other human beings. And if that's too wordy for you, then just stick to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you involve that principle in your interactions with human beings, that's way better and way more reliable than casting lots or flipping coins or trying to determine through luck or chance or happenstance what God would want you to do. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to treat the people around you who are of eternal consequence and everlasting importance the way in which you would like to be treated. And we're not great at it. We're really not. Even as Christians, we are not great at this. We don't tend to want to involve God that much in that decision-making process because we don't like where that answer leads us. That leads us to a life of effort and trial. That leads us to a life lived for one another. It doesn't lead us to us doing whatever we feel like at any given moment. It leads us away from that life. But you're not called as a Christian to live a life for yourself. You're not called as a Christian to live a life of comfort and separation from the world. You are called upon to involve God in these decisions and to have him tell you where you would like to go. But the bigger the decision, the more you're going to want God to be involved. And when it comes to the absolute biggest decision that there is, which is your salvation, my salvation, when it comes to those decisions, as Lutheran Christians especially, we get to say something great about that decision. We get to quote Jesus Christ when he talks about people. We get to say what he said, which is, he says to us, you did not choose me, but I chose you. That selection of Matthias is not because Matthias chose to be an apostle, he was chosen by God. That right there is a small microcosm of what happens to you and I and the rest of us in our baptism, where we are called by God. We don't choose to be Christians, God calls us. He chooses us and calls us by name. We cannot, by our own reason or understanding, believe and come to God. But he calls us by the gospel, enlightens us by his gifts, washes us clean in holy baptism, and makes us a part of his family. We don't make that choice. He does. We don't make the choice for him to come to us in his body and blood at Holy Communion. He chooses to do that. At every stage of our relationship with him, he makes the choice because the choice of eternal salvation is too big of a choice to be left up to you and left up to me. You do not want to be saying to the Lord your God, yes, I have chosen you effectively enough. Instead, you want to do what the Bible tells you to, to rely entirely on the work that he does for you on your behalf. The bigger, more important decisions are the ones you want somebody else to help you make. That is the biggest one that there is. There is none greater. Your eternal destination is the biggest question that is going to affect you, not just in your life, but in eternity. And what we know from the scriptures is that God makes that decision for you by calling you through your baptism, enlightening you with his gifts, and sanctifying you in this life and the life to come. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds always in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I invite you to rise as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We are reminded by scripture that our heavenly father hears the prayers of his people. Assured of his fatherly care, let us speak together the words of the Apostles' Creed regarding the first person of that holy trinity. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. In peace, let us pray to our Lord, beseeching him for the needs of ourselves and of others. Trusting in God's loving response, we pray for the church and for all who are called to lives of service of God's people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the blessing of God upon our nation and its leaders that we may lead peaceable lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the needs of ourselves and others, for healing and restoration, for solace and comfort, especially Anderson, Dennis, Connie, Lloyd, Kieran, Don, Shauna, and Terry. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves that the Holy Spirit would guide us into gracious ways and instill in us a holy confidence in the goodness of our God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With thanks for the faithful examples set by those whose earthly journeys are complete and whose witness to Christ yet inspires us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These things and all else that we should have asked Grant us according to your gracious will, O Lord, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord, our God. You call us to be your people and invite us to bring our cares to you in prayer. You did so love the world that you sent your only Son to be our Redeemer. By his sacrificial life and death and glorious resurrection, he has brought us salvation and has shown us the path to life eternal. Pour upon us now the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we may receive the body and blood of our Lord with true devotion in this sacred fellowship of your pilgrim people. Grant us a foretaste of the feast to come, Heavenly Father that with increased faith we joyfully await a blessed eternity in your glorious presence. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, 
we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We give thanks to you for the gifts of bread and wine here before us and for your gracious provision for all your creatures. Invited by your grace and supported by your love, we come to your table with thanksgiving and praise. Grant that we, with true faith and trust in your words of promise, receive the bread and wine, that is, the very body and blood of Christ, as a guarantee of the salvation that he purchased for us through his innocent suffering and death on the cross. Receive our prayers and praises and grant us your abiding peace. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and praise with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. When he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of our Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. And I invite you to rise. And now may the holy body and precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you steadfast in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for having fed us with the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, assuring us thereby that we are truly members of his body, the church. And we ask you to help us by your Holy Spirit that we continue in this fellowship and do the good works you desire us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold to what is good. Return no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you. 
Amen. You may be seated. As I said, this upcoming Sunday, a week from today, is going to be Pentecost. And Pentecost, let Pentecost be a big deal for you. Let it be a celebration, a festival that you reclaim that the world doesn't even know that it's happening, but you as a Christian can. You as a Christian can know that this is the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the chosen disciples and that they became less of a gathering of the faithful and more of the church. That is the festival of the church when the church became itself. And as I say, reclaim it, enjoy it. Uh, and we'll talk more about that on Pentecost itself. But do be mindful that this is a major festival in the church, and don't miss it in the shuffle. Before we move into common time, of course, and that's, that's forever, but Pentecost is a big deal. So this upcoming Sunday is going to be Pentecost, services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock with the Bible study in between, Beyond the Rail, as you know. On Monday, Amanda and I, no, I will be podcasting. Uh, Amanda will not be. Amanda has a, an online conference to go to, so... Uh, but the Shepcast will happen one way or another, uh, so expect it. And then on Wednesday is the uh, book study at 5.30 and the worship service at 7 o'clock. And then we are going to be having confirmation, sorry, not confirmation, just youth group on Friday evening. And then, as I said, the services on Sunday morning. Do bear in mind, as I've said before, and as I will say again, we have one service at 10 o'clock on the last Sunday of this month, and that will be also our single issue voters meeting on the Constitution. If you have questions about the Constitution, this is the time to ask, not right now, but today will be a good time to ask. You have a ballot in your bulletin if you are here in person. The ballot is in the announcements page, and it has a ballot here where you can tear off or cut off that bottom portion here and drop that off so that we can count your vote if you are not going to be here on the day of. If you forget, get confused, get sidetracked, you got a lot going on, then you are going to have to either tune in to the voters meeting live as it's happening through the internet, or you're going to have to be here in person if you want your vote to be counted. Again, we want to count your vote. We really do. We want your voice to be heard, but we can't just sort of like wait forever on things. We've extended things by a month. We do need your votes to come in at an appropriate time. So again, uh, this is due on the 27th of May. If you get confused or sidetracked or whatever, please do tune in live or be here in person. Speaking of being here in person, I don't know if you caught the news lately uh, that I was on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was interviewed in a very nice piece uh, where, 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 where Dominic was very nice and interviewed me very nicely uh, about how uh, restrictions uh, for sizes of gatherings are going to be eased sooner rather than later. The number that we are working with here at Good Shepherd is 100. That is the number that we have determined that isn't like definitely up to the limit but we've determined that we want to work with. So between here and there, 100 people seems to be appropriate enough given that the maximum space in the sanctuary is listed at 300. A third of this would be 100. So a third of all this, probably fine. So we're gonna be raising our capacity <clears throat> up to 100 at the end of the month, like after the last Sunday in May, probably, once phase one kicks in. <clears throat> Once phase one kicks in, uh, then our gathering limit will be increased to 100, uh, and then we're gonna go from there and see how things change. But again, do be uh, in touch with us here in the church office. Things can change very rapidly. So we'll be finding out about the actual progression of things at the same rate and same pace everybody else does. But rest assured, we're going to work as hard as we can to continue to have as many of God's people who want to meet here safely as they possibly can. Anything further? All right. Then God bless your final week ahead of Pentecost. I invite you to rise for our closing hymn, Hosanna. Hosanna.